Good morning. So I'm here today to talk about recycling at work. And this was a Keep America Beautiful project that we did, uh, a national level project that was funded by PepsiCo. And we're going to conclude with a, a series of very specific recommendations. But what we did was a national experiment to see the design and the infrastructure around bins that would promote recycling behavior. The work was funded by PepsiCo, uh, also conducted in collaboration with CBRE, and done through a research firm called Action Research, and of course, led by Keep America Beautiful, uh, Brenda Poli um, and others. So our goal was to look at the recycling and bin configurations in the workplace that would be linked with recycling behavior. And we looked specifically at three different metrics. One was increasing recycling. Second was to reduce trash in the recycling bin. And third was to reduce recycling in the trash bins. Now, a little bit of an interactive exercise here, kind of wake us up in the morning. A poll. All right. Maybe not that exciting for an interactive exercise. I had high expectations here. So which desk side setup do you think would be most successful at increasing accurate recycling? Remember our three metrics. We wanted to increase recycling. We wanted to reduce the trash that was in the recycling bin. We wanted to reduce recycling that was in the trash bin. So version A is you have no recycling bin at all. You just have trash. And recycling is collected at a central location. Not an uncommon setup. B you have only recycling at your desk. Trash and recycling is collected at a common area. C, you have two equally sized bins, one for recycling and one for trash, both at your workstation, and there's also centralized collection. And D, you have a big recycling and a little trash at your workstation, and again, commonplace recycling and trash. All right, how many A's do we have? All right, an interesting story with A, and I'll come back to that one in a minute. We tried to run version A, uh, and, and it just didn't catch on. All right, any Bs, recycling only? Really? I thought, I thought this would get some takers. I was optimistic, actually, about B. All right, version C, equal recycling and trash. Some, okay. And version D, large recycling, small trash. All right? So C and D. All right, I'll give you the answer at the end. It's going to take 20 minutes. I've got to talk about all the research that we did. It took us a year to get to the point where we have the data that we can say definitively, this is the answer. Otherwise, without the research, nah, we just ask people, they say, oh, I like C, and so we'll go with that one. No, I have the data now to back it. <laughs> All right, just a, a quick background about um, commercial um, trash and, and recycling. Um, commercial is included as part of municipal solid waste, and it's about 40%, this is EPA data, of municipal solid waste comes from the commercial sector. In terms of what it is, uh, largely paper. Paper is the, I mean, despite the goal of having a paperless office, it was not achieved. Uh, and we still have a, a large amount of uh, mixed paper that come out of uh, office settings. Also cardboard, plastics, glass, and metal. There's a lot of office space in our country, in the U.S., and internationally. In the U.S., 5.6 million commercial buildings, totaling over 87 billion square feet of office space. There's a lot of offices. All right, as I said, this was a national project, and we conducted it in four cities, San Diego, Houston, Atlanta, and Boston. It was conducted in partnership with CBRE, all of the offices already had single stream recycling programs. We selected single buildings with the exception of Atlanta, which was a three building office park. And um, they all had existing desk side recycling and trash. So it's not that we were introducing recycling for the first time, we were modifying their existing infrastructure. We started off by doing a survey of all of the employees. Actually, if you back up before that, we had to get the buy-in from, the, from the, the building managers. And so through the CBRE partnership, we were able to do that. 
Then through the building managers, we met with the office managers because each of these were individual offices within the larger building. Then we did a pre-audit employee survey. So we did surveys with all of the employees. Uh, and then we did a waste audit. So before we did anything, we asked people a bunch of questions. We audited their trash. And there's some great pictures. I'll show you one in a minute that has Brenda doing some trash sorts. But we went to the buildings. We worked with the uh, janitorial staff to collect the, the recycling and trash that was coming out. We went down to the basement of the building. We sorted this out. And we counted and coded them into different categories. We then did the bin placement and we let that run for four months and along the way we did a whole series of audits of the trash and waste. And then at the end we did a post audit employee survey. So when I say it took a year, we had to do it and then wait to see what happened and then come back and do our analyses. All right, we had uh, 34 offices that were in our experiment. They had between 20 and 70 employees. Our target was for an average of about 50. Uh, so they were smaller, smaller offices. Um, and each office had typically one, sometimes two uh, local contacts. You can see in this slide the different variations that we use. So we had equal size, recycling only, little trash, uh, big recycling. And then we had a control condition where we didn't do anything. We just provided them with some educational materials. I should say that all of the different versions also receive the same educational material, so we're able to see, all right, what if we just did education and nothing else? And we're able to test that against these other bin configurations. Uh, one of the things to notice is that we had um, several offices that after hearing about the program that they were gonna get, opted out. They refused to participate. And, you know, we implored them, it's for science, right? Um, initially, when we, when we went into it, one of our conditions was trash only and no recycling. And remember, all of these offices already had recycling, and they all declined. They said, we have recycling, you cannot take it away from our employees. We said, it's for science, we want to know what would happen. They said, no, we don't care, we're out. So those of you who voted for number one on the option, I'm sorry, but that was the, the least effective. Nobody bought into that one. All right, but we do have the other three that we're going to test here. All right, so we had the little trash, and the, the graphics that you see on the bins were uh, custom graphics that the PepsiCo um, uh, graphics team created for us, uh, and they were stamped on these. So we had the, uh, the little trash and the small recycling. We had the equal sized, again, with the same uh, logo and same graphics. We had the recycling only. And finally, we had the information only. They also received the same common bins um, in the, the central work area. They had the same branding. They had the educational materials. Um, and you can see they were co-located next to each other. The PepsiCo team also created for us a, an informational flyer. The color and the logo were consistent with the bins. And importantly, it targeted those specific materials that were frequently disposed in the workplace. So here's an image of our team uh, doing these waste audits, right? So we would collect with the janitorial staff, we would collect all of the stuff, take it down, spread it out, and then sort it and code it into the different categories. If you've never done a waste audit, highly recommend it. Um, and there's an interesting book out, and some of you have probably read it, called Garbology, right? Which is the study of waste. We also did our employee survey. We did this pre, before we did anything else. We also did a post version. This was a web-based survey. Uh, and we used the protocol that we've used with our other surveys with a pre-notification and then we sent the link and it was uh, supported through the office manager. One of the things that we wanted to test, and I'm not going to talk too much about this because it actually didn't work, um, was to see if there was spillover. So if we were successful at increasing recycling in the workplace, would we see spillover of that behavior into other contexts? So people who are now recycling better at work, they say they're recycling better at home or they're recycling better in, in public places. So can we use the workplace as a way to get people engaged and then to sustain that engagement over time into other places? And as I said, I'm not going to talk much about this because it, it didn't work. We didn't find evidence for spillover. So our monthly waste audits, we had total weight. We had weight separated by the different items that were on that educational flyer that we used. And then because our focus with the PepsiCo funding was on cans and bottles, and those are typically pretty light, the plastic, we counted those as well. 
First off, just from the initial audit, the frequency of incorrect disposal. So how are people doing before we even began? And what you see here on the, the left is the percentage of offices that had trash in the recycling bins. And then on the right, you see the percentage of offices that had recycling in the trash bins. So on the left side, 92% of offices had paper towels, which were in the trash bin, but should have been in the recycling bin. No, let me take that back. I said, I said that reversed, so let me say it the other way. Uh, which were trash, but were in the recycling bin. And then on the other side of it, you can see that they had paper, which was recyclable, but was in the trash bin, 79%. So there was already a lot of confusion, maybe not a lot of confusion, because you don't know if people are just not knowledgeable or just not complying or don't care. Um, but there was a lot of incorrect materials in the bins. All right, we then looked at the average recycling rate per office, and we, on the next slide, I'll show average trash weight per office. And we have baseline, which was before we did anything. And then we have short term, which was why we were doing it. And then we had longer term, which was after we completed. And the interpretation here is that recycling rates were highly variable and didn't show a clear pattern of change. So remember, one of our metrics was we wanted to increase recycling over time by changing the bin structure. We did not. But I'll come back to that. All right, with regard to trash, we thought, well, if we increased recycling, we should decrease trash. The interpretation is that trash rates were highly variable and didn't show a clear pattern of change over time. Now, I think part of this is we were a little bit naive and optimistic coming into it, and we had this grand vision that all of a sudden people are going to be recycling, 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 and there's going to be no trash. The reality is what happened is we didn't change the quantity of material that was coming out of the offices, but we shifted it so that the total weights remained the same over time. We didn't see a change in the volume of recyclable because remember when we coded the recyclable, we coded everything that was in the recycling bin. And there was trash in the recycling bin and so we just said, all right, how much stuff is in the recycling bin? How much stuff is in the trash bin? So I think a better metric here is to say, all right, well, how much of the stuff that's in the trash is recyclable? And here what we find is that for the condition four, the one that was the little trash with the big recycling, we find fewer recyclables were in the trash. And the same trend we find for the equal size, um, Interestingly, for the recycling only, we actually see the opposite. So we see an increase in the amount of trash that's in the recycling. They don't have a trash can, right? So it's easier. So first thing that we found is regarding um, general self-reported knowledge. So how much do people say that they know about recycling? And here we see increases over time for both the recycling only and the little trash condition. So people say, yes, I know more about recycling. We also had a test, so we gave them specific items that could be or couldn't be recycled in their workspace and we asked them to tell us, so this is the percentage that they got right on the test. And we see an increase for the equal size, the little trash, and the information only condition. So people are more knowledgeable as a result of that educational material. Just to conclude, my view, looking at all of the data that we collected, was that the little trash was the optimal setup. It increased correct disposals. So with regard to recycling in the trash, it decreased it from an aggregated 29% to 13%. So there was less recyclables in the trash, um, and there were there was less trash in the recyclables. I gotta make sure that I say that correctly. Just some quotes from people who were in the little trash condition. One person said, the thing I did differently because of recycling at work was I pay more attention when I dispose of anything. And I think having that little trash prompted people to think about it. Is this trash, is this recycling? Another person said, I particularly liked about recycling at work was the different size bins, they really helped me. All right, so that I would say was the optimal. Um, the equal size was also had some positive results. Um, they weren't as clear cut as what we saw for the, uh, for the little trash. Um, but just a couple quotes. The thing I did differently because of recycling at work, I recycled more often and with more confidence since I now have a better understanding of what to recycle and what not to. So, recommendations. 
Number one, make recycling easy. The convenience factor is huge here. Include paired bins in common areas, keep the signage simple and graphical, and put the message on or near the recycling bin. A lot of times we put the message separated from the bin, so put it in the same place as the behavior. Second, to use effective placement. Co-locate the recycling and the trash in the workstation, use single stream, and our recommendation here is to use the little trash setup. Finally, be consistent. One program throughout the building, same color, same images, same messages, same placement. It decreases confusion uh, and it helps with the janitorial and the cleaning staff. All right, thank you very much. Question? Yeah, question was, how did we control for self-reported bias in the surveys that we did? We didn't and you can't. I think what you can do with the bias is recognize that it's going to be there and it's going to be consistent across the different conditions. So you're able to compare people who are in that control condition with people who are in your other conditions and so it's relative change. But in terms of absolute, if you just ask people how knowledgeable are you about recycling, you're going to get a biased answer. And I think, that, I think it's a really important point because we use the survey to augment the data that we collected by using the waste audits. So those waste audits are really the key piece of it. it had we relied solely on the surveys, I think it would have been a very weak study. Yeah, a good question. So how did the cleaning staff react to our different bins? We didn't get complaints about the little bin. Um, they grumbled a little bit about the added workload responsible for coding it, but not necessarily just the collecting of it, right? Because they were working with us, we met with them regularly, we did the training, they were doing some codings for us, so it was those things that were added workload for them. Um, but we didn't get any complaints about the actual just implementation of the bins. We're right on time. So, thank you very much.